Good afternoon, everybody. This is Denise Jess with the Wisconsin Council um, Executive Director, and I am uh, so, so pleased to have you join us today. Um, and so on behalf of the entire council, warm welcome. And thank you for your interest in um, advocacy. Um, our advocacy work is so critical for uh, creating greater inclusion for people with vision loss in Wisconsin. Our founders understood this and advocacy was the first piece of work that the council embarked on. And no matter how skilled we are um, with our own blindness skills, there are barriers in public policy that we cannot overcome without policy change. So your interest, whether this is your first um, opportunity to participate in public policy advocacy, or you've been doing it a long time, I am thrilled that you are here. Uh, not only does it help pave a greater path of equity for us right now, your efforts and our efforts actually pay it forward so future generations might uh, walk an easier path to equity than um, those of us living right now and experiencing the world right now are, um, are managing. This afternoon, we will do an overview of the Council's uh, uh, public policy priorities so that everyone has a shared understanding of those. We'll look at the landscape of the Wisconsin um, legislature currently, take a look at the budget process so that folks have a really good understanding of that, and then overview the council's budget priorities and how to be a really effective advocate. Joining me this afternoon uh, to share this content um, is Aaron Fabrizius and Michael Blumenfeld um, is also with us. Both Aaron and Michael are with Blumenfeld and Associates, and we work with Michael and Aaron really closely in the public policy world. They're outstanding uh, partners because they keep track of all the new legislation um, that's being introduced. It's a volume that is beyond my capacity to manage. Um, and they help create um, and pave relationships for um, on our behalf so that we can um, have conversations with legislators, with the governor's office. So we're so grateful to partner with them. And this is our seventh year of doing that. So Aaron and Michael, I'd love to turn it to you to do brief intros. And Michael, after you finish your intro, if you can pitch it back to me, I'll kick off the presentation. So Aaron, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, thank you for that introduction, Denise. Uh, as you said, Michael and I have been working with the council in our capacity as Blumenfeld and Associ Associates, which is a, a state-based lobbying um, and association management firm for the past seven years. Um, and we really value your partnership and your leadership and, and love working with you. Um, so as Jean said, a lot of what Michael and I do for the council is help track legislation, help track the budget bill, set up meetings with key policymakers, um, things like that. So I will pitch it to Michael um, to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Uh, Michael Blumenfeld, and just great to be here and, and really want to thank all of you for being here today. I know everybody's time is, is very valuable, and this is just so important. Um, as Denise outlined, and you'll, you'll hear, a lot, hear a lot more why it's so important, but we can't do this without you. We, uh, it's a privilege to work with Denise and the council, um, and this lobby day that we all work on uh, is very important as we try to move some of our issues forward. So thank you, and uh, I will turn it back to Denise. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Erin. And Bob, whenever you're ready, you can launch the PowerPoint. So um, in full disclosure, we do have uh, PowerPoint slides and uh, we'll be using them as reference points um, this afternoon. If you, um, well, you'll be receiving a copy of the slides in accessible format um, after the session is over, as well as a recording, a link to the recording. It may not be immediately, 
it definitely won't be immediately, but it'll happen soon. And that way you've got the slides for reference because there's quite a bit of information that we wanna share with you and might be nice to have them as a reference um, later on. So um, we'll go ahead and get started whenever you're ready, Bob. Fantastic, and we can go past the cover slide. So uh, I think many of you are very familiar with the council's work, um, and I'm so proud of our mission that I like to touch base on it whenever possible. So our work is to promote the dignity and empowerment of people living in Wisconsin uh, with vision loss through advocacy, education, and vision services. Those are all equally important aspects, um, and they really work together very, very beautifully when we, as people with vision loss, have strong blindness skills, um, we're able to move through the world uh, with more ease. When we educate our wider communities um, about who we are as people with vision loss, we have the possibility of opening hearts and minds. And when we advocate on the public policy side, we help uh, change legislation to create greater equity. Our guiding values are um, uncompromising respect, integrity, and inclusion. And those values are very important in the public policy and advocacy side of the work. So. We uh, value our relationships with the governor's office. We value our relationships with legislators. And we know that when um, that mutual respect is living there, that there's a greater possibility for conversation, dialogue, and positive change. And we can move forward. Several years ago, um, the council, the council board and I established some um, advocacy priorities. And these have just been a powerful foundation for guiding our advocacy work because there's so many things that can pull us in many directions um, when it comes to public policy advocacy. So these become um, our foundation. And then when uh, certain, um, situations happen that might be positive or might even be negative, then we spend more time focused on any one or a combination of these. So the first one is, and these are not in particular order, they're just alphabetized. Um, the first one is accessibility and civil rights. This can include everything from voting rights, and during the pandemic, we saw a number of threats to our rights as voters with vision loss. Um, and we also desperately need to see some forward movement in greater accessibility. So this is one that's always near the top of our list. We also uh, do work in ex the accessibility of public websites and where we have influence is our in-state um, agency public websites. And we've made some really good progress with our state agency partners, and we still have a long way to go. And then other civil rights issues like re um, things related to guide dogs is another thing that comes to my mind as an example. Education and employment are always on our priority list, though we don't spend as much time with these. Um, as we do others because our influence in other areas is actually much higher. Um, health and long-term care is uh, an ongoing issue of concern for the council, particularly with the caregiver crisis that we are experiencing now, the lack of Medicaid expansion in this state, and then also issues related to funding and quality of service with the Office for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And we'll talk more about that in particular at tomorrow's Lunch and Learn session. And then the last priority is transportation. Transportation, as we all know, is key to quality of life 
um, without affordable, available, and accessible transportation, we don't go. Um, so it is um, a high priority for the council to keep working in this area. I'm proud to be the co-chair of the Wisconsin Non-Driver Advisory Committee, which is a, a program within the Department of Transportation and a national leader as well in this area. So we've got an open door here to, um, to make some positive change, and we are really capitalizing on that. We can move forward. Uh, we would highly encourage you to read the council's um, advocacy priorities. They're located on our website. Uh, the email that you received from Kathleen as a welcome to this session has a link. This link will also be available to you in the PowerPoint um, deck when you get it. Um, there are seven documents. They describe the issues and then talk about our budget, our legislative, and our agency um, asks and work. And uh, be, particularly if you're joining us for the Capitol Day in May, or you're planning a conversation with your legislators, um, please take um, some time to review those documents. We can move forward. And um, let's turn to Erin um, because she is going to pick up here to talk about the legislative lay of the land and to walk us through the state budget. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, Denise. Um, so our we focus mostly at the at the council on the Wisconsin state legislature, um, more so than the federal government. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, in Wisconsin, our state legislature convened its current session in January of 2023, um, following the election in November of 2022. We continue to have divided government. So Governor Tony Evers was elected to a second term. So our executive branch is democratic. Our legislative branch, um, the legislature continues to have strong Republican majorities in both houses. Um, so in the state assembly, there are 64 Republicans and 35 Democrats. And in the state Senate, um, they now will have a veto proof majority um, after a special election that was held in April. Um, so the Senate will have 22 Republicans and 11 Democrats. Um, so again, divided government, it's, it's more of the same. This is how things were last session, um, requires compromise um, in both sides to try and work together. So we'll talk a little bit about how that dynamic is impacting the budget process. You can advance the slide. Um, so the first big thing that happened in the current legislative session was Governor Evers introduced his state budget bill. Um, this bill is very significant. It is the biggest piece of legislation to pass every session, both literally and figuratively. So the bill itself is about 1,800 pages long. Um, and also in terms of metaf metaphorically being large and significant, it, it really funds everything that um, our state government touches. So it's a very significant piece of legislation. Uh, and so Governor Evers introduced his budget bill on February, for, February 15th, 2023. You can advance the slide. Um, so like I was saying, the state budget impacts literally everyone. It's a very significant piece of legislation. The budget bill introduced by the governor is 103 billion with a B dollars. Um, so that's a two year spending plan. And it funds everything from mass transit to DVR services, the Office of Blind and Visually Impaired Services, education, special education, healthcare services. So if you're on Badger Care, Family Care, IRIS, the budget funds your program, election administration, and much more. So basically it's anything from the roads we drive on to the schools we go to or send our loved ones to, to the water we drink. Um, the budget really touches everything. Next slide, thank you. Um, so as I said, it's a 1,800 page bill. So we don't have time to get into all the details, but we did pull out a few highlights um, related to the council's priorities. So one of our biggest priorities is typically transportation. So in the bill that the governor introduced, um, there's a, quite a, a number of transportation proposals. It would create regional transit authorities. Um, so that's 
would allow municipalities or even counties to work together to jointly provide transit services. So trying to create more connections in our transportation system. Uh, it provides a 4% per year increase to mass transit operating systems, provides $10 million per year for a transit capital assistance grant program. So this is money that municipalities could get to replace transit buses or do kind of other capital improvements to their transit system. It provides a 15% per year increase to the senior and individuals with disabilities specialized assistance program. So this is money that goes to counties to try and fund transportation services for older adults and people with disabilities. It tends to be a bit more focused in rural areas or kind of small urban areas. And then Denise mentioned she's the co-chair of the non-driver advisory committee. They've been coming up with some ideas and recommendations related to supporting non-driver services in Wisconsin. The governor's budget bill does give them some funding to help implement those ideas, including maybe um, increasing funding for mobility managers. And it reinstates the complete streets program. This was something that was repealed by a previous administration. By reinstating it, it would just mean that whenever we do kind of transportation construction, in this state, those projects would have to look at things like bike lanes or other pedestrian um, measures related to that project. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of healthcare, uh, OBVI, the Office of Blind and Visually Impaired, uh, does employ several rehabilitation specialists um, who help kind of provide vision rehabilitation services in the state. So if you've had experience with OBVI, you know there are access issues with that office. It's very hard to get services. In reflection of that or in acknowledgement of that, the governor's budget provides $135,600 to fund one new rehabilitation specialist position with OBVI. Obviously, that's not enough to address those access issues, but it is a step in the right direction. And then as Denise mentioned, Badger Care eligibility, um, the governor's budget accepts federal funding to expand Medicaid, specifically Badger Care eligibility um, to people who have incomes up to 138% of the federal poverty level. Um, by doing this, Wisconsin is currently one of 10 states that has not accepted federal funding to expand Badger Care. If we were to do it in this budget, it would save 1.6 billion with a B dollars and cover an additional 89,600 people. Uh, in terms of kind of accessibility civil rights issues, some of you may remember Steve who used to be on the council's board of directors. Steve was a very passionate advocate for um, accessibility to rec outdoor recreation for people who are blind and visually impaired. Uh, and something that he had been advocating for a long time for before he passed away was to allow Wisconsin ID cards to be used for um, proof of residency for the DNR Go Wild site. So that's where you can get like fishing permits um, and different kind of outdoor recreation permits. So the governor's budget does put language in there to enact that change. Next slide. On the topic of voting, the governor's budget creates an office of transparency and compliance that would be attached to the Wisconsin Elections Commission. It would have a whole host of duties kind of about election law. One of those duties would be to research and provide assistance related to the statewide accessibility audit. So looking at um, accessible voting machines, how easy it is for people with disabilities to vote. It also creates an automatic voter registration and process in Wisconsin. So the Department of Transportation and the Wisconsin Election Commission would work together um, to exchange information and automatically register um, eligible voters based on DOT data. And then it eliminates restrictions on how soon a person may cast an in-person absentee ballot. Currently in Wisconsin law, you can only vote in-person absentee two, starting two weeks before the election. This would eliminate that restriction and go back to how the system used to be, where municipalities could kind of set their own hours and processes for in-person absentee voting. Next slide. 
So those are some of the highlights that the council is looking at in the budget, just to talk to you about the timeline. Uh, it's a very, very long process that actually started in 2022. So like the spring and summer of 2022, state agencies developed a list of things that they wanted the governor to put in his budget. It was part of that time frame. Denise met with different agencies and the governor's office. Those agencies sent their budget requests to the governor in September of 2022. And then the governor spent the fall and winter working on his budget bill, which was then ultimately introduced in February of 2023. Next slide. So this is where we're at now, April of 2023. Um, once the governor introduces his budget, it is immediately referred to the legislature's joint finance committee. Um, it's typically referred to as the legislature's budget writing committee. One of the first things that committee does is they do what's called the roadshow and they go and hold public hearings across the state. So I'm sorry, I have to take a drink of water. I apologize. <clears throat> sorry about that. <clears throat> My throat was getting dry. Um, so the Joint Finance Committee is currently in the process of holding their public hearings on the budget. They've done three so far. Denise spoke at the one in the Wisconsin Dells. And there's the final one is next week in Manaqua on April 26th. There's also a process for people to do written comments. Um, so the committee has an email address and they also have an online portal where you can submit online comments about the budget if you can't make it to one of those in-person hearings. And the hearings are very significant. Every year there's like two or three issues that really rise to the top. And lawmakers become really committed to trying to address those during the budget process. After those hearings wrap up, the committee comes back to Madison to start voting on the budget agency by agency. So that will happen early May through June. And then the finance committee can add, remove, or modify anything in the budget bill. So they really reshape the budget as introduced by the governor, which we'll talk about in a second. <laughs> And then the full legislature at the end of the day, every single member of the Senate and every single member of the assembly have to take a vote on the budget bill. So once finance is done with their work, they voted out of committee, usually in June, the, each house of the legislature will take a vote on the bill as passed by the finance committee, June, maybe July. And then the bill makes its way back to the governor's desk and the governor can veto the bill in full. I've never seen that happen. They can partially veto the bill. Wisconsin governor actually is one of the strongest veto pens in the country. He can do a line item veto. I've always seen, <laughs> I've never seen a budget where there haven't been a few partial vetoes, even in one party control. So expect some vetoes by the partial vetoes by the governor, or he can sign it as is. I've also never seen that happen. So typically some partial vetoes by the governor, and then he signs it into the law. That's usually end of June, early July. So that's kind of the time frame we're working with here. It's a very long process. Next slide, thank you. So just to talk a little bit more about the Joint Finance Committee because they are so important. They're referred to as the Legislature's Budget Writing Committee. They have 16 members. Because the legislature has st such strong Republican majorities, Republicans have a very strong majority on the committee. There are 12 Republicans and four Democrats on the committee. Again, they can add, remove, or modify anything in the governor's budget bill. So they really make their own version of the budget. Um, the two co-chairs of the committee are Senator Howard Markline, a Republican from Spring Green, and um, Representative Mark Bourne, a Republican from Beaver Dam. They both issued statements after the governor introduced his budget bill, blasting it, saying it's a liberal wish list, it's not based on reality. Um, so they've really been talking about working from base budget, which means that they look at current funding levels and decide what they want to add in. Um, you'll see one of the first votes they typically take as a committee when they come back to Madison in May will be removing what they determine to be non-fiscal policy items. So a lot of items will get removed and taken out of consideration. I would expect like the RTA language to be some of the language that get, gets pulled out. 
even though it has a fiscal component, last budget, they removed Medicaid as a non-fiscal policy item. So they really remake the bill. Next slide, please. All right, so all lawmakers are important <laughs> in the budget process. Um, but if your lawmaker is on the Joint Finance Committee, if they are one of those 16 members, they are extra, extra important. Um, so if your lawmaker is one of the following people I'm going to read off, please make sure you're reaching out to them. So on the assembly side, Representative Mark Bourne of Beaver Dam, Representative Terry Katzma of Oostburg, Shannon Zimmerman of River Falls, Jesse Rodriguez of Oak Creek, Tony Kurtz of Waniwak, Alex Dahlman of Green Lake, Evan Goyke of Milwaukee, and Tip McGuire of Kenosha. So if your state representative is one of those people, they are on the Joint Finance Committee and they are extra, extra important. And then on the Senate side, we have Senator Howard Markline of Spring Green, Senator Dewey Strobel of Sockville, Senator Mary Falskowski of Irma, Senator Joan Balwig of Marquesan, Senator Teston, Patrick Teston of Stevens Point, Senator Eric Wimberger of Green Bay, Senator, Senator Latanya Johnson of Milwaukee, and Senator Calder Royce of Madison. So if you're a senator, state senator is one of those people, they are on the finance committee and they are super important. So again, all lawmakers, state reps, state senator, take a vote on the budget bill at the end of the day. So even if your lawmaker is not on that list, they are important because uh, the finance committee does something called a budget buddy process where lawmakers who are not on finance get assigned to a member of finance where they can sort of raise issues. So all lawmakers are still important, but if you've got one of those 16 finance members, they're extra important. Next slide, thank you. Erin, thank you so much. So I, this is Denise again. I'm gonna pick up um, and talk about the budget priorities that the council is really highlighting um, given that we are likely starting from base budget. Uh, we'll go into these some of these in more detail in the sessions on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, so I'm really hopeful that you'll be joining us for those two lunch and learns. The first, um, where we have a lot of specific budget asks is in transportation. The overarching theme for our budget um, requests is that we see increases to the really vital transportation programs that um, move Wisconsin's 31% of the population who are non-drivers to the places where we need to go. If you are talking with uh, your legislators about transportation, I really wanna encourage you to use that data point. 31% of Wisconsinites do not drive. And when I share that piece of information um, with lawmakers, with the general public, um, it's shocking to them because they think that the people generally think that the population is much, much smaller. So non-drivers are those of us with vision loss, um, other disabilities, aging adults, uh, students, people with low income, people who choose not to drive, and people who are unlicensed for a variety of reasons. So please get, get, that, um, get that number into your advocacy work. When we get together with you on Thursday, I'm gonna go through some very specific asks around transportation. Um, I'm working with uh, five other um, organizations that serve people with disabilities and older adults, and we are crafting a budget motion that we will be meeting with uh, members of the Joint Finance Committee to introduce, to ask, and look for a champion. So more details on Thursday regarding that. One of our other budget asks is for that funding for the Office for the Blind and Visually Impaired to the tune of $135,000. Um, that increase in uh, personnel can help lower the um, number of uh, people that uh, folks have on their caseloads, which um, can help you people be seen sooner and more frequently. 
Um, that OBVI ask is a direct result of that work that we did last summer to meet with the um, secretary of the Department of Health Services and, of, and her staff to uh, really shine the light on the increasing numbers of adults, particularly older adults with vision loss in Wisconsin and um, the disproportionality of how people with vision loss are doing health-wise um, and emotionally. Um, and we'll be sharing a lot of that information with you all tomorrow. So I'm hopeful that you'll join us for the noon session on healthcare because there's some very important data that we now have access to. Steve's Law, as Erin mentioned, is one that we will um, definitely support again. My intuition tells me that joint finance will remove this one from the budget um, because it doesn't um, have uh, a direct fiscal, um, even though it has a fiscal note or a, um, a spending amount on it, it's not quite as um, budgetary maybe. So if this one gets removed from the budget, we will work um, with other organizations who care about this issue to get it reintroduced as a bill and we can go forward. Other budget priorities, um, Medicaid expansion is really critical. It's very disappointing that we are one of 10 states that do not have Medicaid expansion um, for the reasons that Aaron named. Um, but we know from direct experience that when um, folks get employment, um, as they get settled with that employment and their income rises, if they hit that threshold, they either need to um, they get kicked off of Medicaid, um, Badger Care, or they have to leave the job. And we really want folks to be able to maintain their employment and stay insured. So Medicaid expansion is so incredibly, incredibly critical. And then in the voting arena, Things that we care about from a budgetary standpoint um, are the polling place audits. So if you're not familiar with this program, um, we um, the, the Wisconsin Elections Commission, every election sends people out into the polls to check to see about accessibility across disability. I serve on the Accessible Advisory Committee and helped craft that checklist of what these auditors are looking at. You know, is the accessible voting equipment set up and ready to go, for example? Are there signature guides and magnifying glasses available? Um, are pathways um, clearly marked? And that audit program requires funding to pay those auditors either from the Elections Commission temporary employees uh, partnering with Disability Rights Wisconsin and the Centers for Independent Living. And we want to see that program grow so that more audits can be performed on elections, election day and we can get more information and work with clerks to remedy accessibility issues. Additionally, um, we are asking for funding for the uh, accessible supply program so we want these clerks to um, have those magnifying glasses, signature guides, um, curbside voting, um, doorbells and signs um, and cones for um, making sure that they're marking their accessible parking stalls available and this supply program um, does that. A couple of things we'll want to introduce, see if we can get champions for that are not budgetary related. Um, uh, 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 continue our work on an accessible absentee ballot in the state of Wisconsin because we do not have one. And we can go forward. So when we think about um, the state budget, we very much want to encourage you to submit written comment on what's really important to you from what you're learning today. Uh, that you want to make sure um, is part of our budget, you know, and really make a case for it. When I spoke at the Joint Finance Committee hearing last week, um, I was um, very moved, actually, and sad at the small number of people speaking 
directly about the needs of people with uh, disabilities, let alone the even smaller number of people who were raising concerns about the needs of people with vision loss. I think I was the only person identified as someone with vision loss in a room of a couple hundred people. So the very barriers that uh, we deal with every day, like lack of transportation, keep people from participating in these public processes, but it's awesome that we have other mechanisms for doing that. So um, we'll be sure that you get the link to the portal for the Joint Finance Committee and that email so that you can submit comment. My recommendation is that you submit your comments by next Wednesday, um, April 26th. That's the date of the last hearing. We don't know exactly when this portal is going to close and it would be really sad to wait and then have the portal close and not have that mechanism for turning in comment. When you send in your comment to the Joint Finance Committee, um, I wanna really also encourage you to send it to your own state senator and state assembly person so that they are aware of what's important to you. If you need a model for written comment, let me know and I can send you my um, verbal testimony for um, the Joint Finance Committee as a potential model, but because it's written comment, you can, you know, ex you can expand on your comments a bit. Uh, we can go forward. Our role as advocates is really to educate and to advocate. Education is actually the first thing I think about when I am connecting with a lawmaker um, or a policymaker because they deal with so many issues. The Joint Finance Committee last week was such a great example of that. Someone would come to the mic and they would talk about school funding. The next person two minutes later would be talking about PFAS in water. After the next two minutes, somebody might be talking about funding for EMS and fire in our rural communities. And then the next person is talking about the caregiver crisis in our state. So um, legislators have to know a little bit about a lot of things. And in many cases, um, when we meet with them, they, we may be the first person with vision loss that they have ever um, encountered. Maybe they have a family member who is starting to lose sight um, or they know constituents, but in many cases, we might be the first. So um, how we interact with them, treat them with respect um, and help them learn about our reality is incredibly, incredibly critical. And then of course, our advocacy really matters. And one of the things I really wanna highlight is that whenever we meet with a policymaker um, and we're there in our advocacy role that we're really clear about what we're asking for. One of the things when I talk to legislators um, from their perspective, what makes for really effective advocacy. And I also know this because I'm a transportation commissioner with the city of Madison. And I always get super sad when someone comes to testify at one of our public hearings and they forget, they get so busy telling their story that they forget to, to tell us what they want. And it's a missed opportunity. And so be sure that you work that ask into your advocacy effort. And then we can uh, move forward really considering those policymakers as our partners. So we are very hopeful that um, you will join us in the Capitol on May 3rd. I know some of you on this list have said, yes, I'm, I'm definitely going. Others of you attending today are maybes and others of you are like, mm, I don't think so. Maybe other, other commitments. If it's possible for you to join us, um, we would love that. I think it's super important to um, have folks with vision loss in the Capitol, um, again, as ambassadors um, and to create that visibility. If one of the things that is a concern for you is um, navigation, because it is not an easy building to navigate, 
Um, we are working very diligently to um, get volunteers who can assist with guiding while we're in the Capitol. So part of our time will be spent in half an hour visits, one each with um, a senator, one each with your representative. If they aren't available, they'll be meeting with, you'll be meeting with their staff. Meeting with staff is just as important as meeting with the legislator themselves because the staff are often the filtration device of what gets actually to the lawmaker. So when we can have an effective meeting with staff and they um, push that information forward to their boss, that can be incredibly, incredibly effective. And we can go forward. So if you do decide that you'd like to come um, and you hadn't said yes, um, just reach out to Kathleen and she can work with you to make that happen. Really make the most of your visit, whether it's in the Capitol or in a phone conversation with your legislator or a Zoom meeting or when you meet with your legislator back in the district, which, you know, there's opportunities to do that as well. Know who they, know, know your subject really well. So if you're talking with them about transportation, know which transportation programs benefit you, you know, which ones are really important to you and understand those programs. The work that we're going to do on Thursday, I think, could be very illuminating for a lot of folks um, so that you can speak from a knowledgeable place. And if uh, the legislator or the staff asks you questions you don't know, don't worry about it, just let them know, hey, I'm not sure about that. Let me find out and I'll get back to you. Never make up an answer or guess when you're talking to a legislator. If you don't know, there's no shame in that. Check in with us and we can support you. Um, figure out what you wanna accomplish in that meeting. You know, some of my meetings are simply meet and greets and that's okay. You know, I'm building relationship with that, um, with that policy maker. Others are much more focused. I have a concrete ask that, um, that I want, or I want to work with them um, and see if they'll become a champion on some of our work. Tell your story um, to the legislator. The concrete examples are powerful. And we're gonna talk in just a minute about how to do that really well, but ground them in facts. So that 31%, for example, of Wisconsinites do not drive is a really important fact to work into your transportation story. Or data on you know, 4.2% of Wisconsinites over age 65 live with significant vision loss. Ground that fact into your story when you're talking about the need for services. And then listen and learn and respond in the conversation. It's a conversation. I learn so much when I'm talking with legislators. I might learn more about their family. I met with our um, state senator, my state senator, um, not too long ago and was really moved to learn about her grandmother who is um, experiencing macular degeneration. And, um, and that was, it was an important touch base point for the Senator and I to have. Um, I might learn more about strategy that they're thinking of or places where they will say outright, this is where you're gonna hit a roadblock um, with what you're trying to do here. That's all valuable information. And if you learn something really important from your visit with your lawmaker, let us know because that can help us with strategy. And we can move forward, recognizing time. Um, so I wanna introduce you to um, the advocacy message sandwich. And I love metaphoric metaphors because they really help me make sure, have I included all of the necessary parts in something? And there is, definitely a way to do advocacy effectively. And when we remember all of the parts, we have um, the potential for a just a, um, a really powerful and, and meaningful message. So this sandwich metaphor helps me remember all of the parts. So first, of course, in a good sandwich, you want a decent piece of bread. 
And that bread is your introduction and your greeting um, to the lawmaker. And keep that greeting you know, brief and focused. Tell them the things that are important rather than the whole, your whole life story. So, you know, I'm Denise Jess, I'm the executive director of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. If I'm talking about transportation, I may say I'm the co-chair of the Wisconsin Non-Driver um, Advisory Committee, and I'm a person who lives with vision loss, and I'm a non-driver. Um, greet them warmly so that they know right away that you're interested in them and in the conversation. Then that bread needs some good condiments on it. And that is really to talk about why are you there? Um, you know, what's your top concern? And to really pick one or two to focus on. If you try to do six or seven things with your legislator in that half an hour, they won't be able to track it and it will wash out your message and you'll run out of time. So pick those things that really sit at the top for you and, um, and tell them why you're there. You know, I'd really like to talk with you today about our transportation programs in the state because um, I'm, I'm negatively in, impacted by, um, by, by access and it really uh, changes my life. Then we wanna have some really good protein in that sandwich, whether it's meat or cheese or hummus. Um, that's really kind of the bulk of the conversation. You know, what is, why is this issue important to you? Um, how is it impacting you? This is where you can bring in some of those facts and data points. And then we go back to more condiments. This is where we wanna be sure we ask for what we want. So, you know, I'd really love to see that our mass transit system um, is funded um, at at least 4% um, over the base budget because many of our vehicles are aging and we really need to be able to expand routes so that we can get to more neighborhoods and decrease the walking distance for people who struggle to walk to the bus stop. So be very concrete with that ask. And then always, always use your best grace, gracious, graciousness um, and add that last piece of bread by thanking them, seeing if there's any follow-up that you, you'll wanna do um, with them, sending them anything that you committed to sending them, et cetera. So as you prepare for our capital day, I want to invite you in advance to get your advocacy sandwich all ready to go um, so that you feel really confident and even practice your messaging a little bit with someone so that you feel really confident going into those offices. And we can move forward. Um, one of the things you can do before our day in May, or even right after this meeting, is go to the website legis.wisconsin.gov, and you can enter your address. If you don't know who your representatives are, you can do that lookup, and you can learn a lot about your lawmakers. Um, on this slide, I've got the page for Melissa Sargent, who is um, one of the legislators in the Madison area. And I can learn a lot about Melissa. I can look at what committees she's on. I can see what pieces of legislation she's either authored or co-authored. And I can start to see what her priorities are. So when I meet with her, I can try to find that connection point. And next slide. And um, again, uh, we'll give you that um, link to the legislative lookup page. I will tell you though, I find as a screen reader user, I find the page to be clunky on a good day and I'm a pretty skilled screen reader user. So if you're running into barriers, there is the legislative hotline phone number. Um, the legislative hotline, I think, is amazing for helping people to connect with their legislators. They won't, it's not a switchboard, so they're not going to be, you know, transferring you to the legislator, but they'll tell you who that legislator is. If you don't know, they'll give you the phone number and the email address. They can also take um, a message for your legislator. 
And that phone number, again, you'll get it in the slides, but I'm going to say it a couple times and, re and repeat it. So it's 800-362-9472. Again, 800-362-9472. Just really a critical, critical number. And you can also let them know that the that legislative lookup page wasn't accessible for you so that they can count that data as well and we can move forward. Um, there's lots of ways besides going to the Capitol to connect with your state policymaker. So um, if you're like, oh, I can't go to the Capitol day, shoot. Um, you can set up a phone appointment with them. You can set up a, potentially a Zoom or Teams meeting with them. They'll be back in the district. They usually take a break after the state budget passes. So you maybe invite them to coffee um, at your favorite coffee house. One of my colleagues invited her legislator to coffee and she's a wheelchair user, mobility device user. And the coffee house he suggested was not accessible to her. So it was a great learning opportunity for her to say, that sounds like an awesome place, but I can't get in there with my wheelchair. Um, or I can't get there on public transportation. Could we meet here instead? And then going to forums and town halls. Um, and a lot of those are virtual and we can move forward. So we, um, we have at the end of the um, formal presentation and I wanna turn to Jackson um, who has been monitoring our chat I haven't heard anything come in on the chat, Jackson, but I want to double check with you and then also invite folks if you have questions to be able to unmic um, or unmute and, and speak your questions. But first, let's check in with Jackson. And currently, there's uh, no questions in chat, but yeah, you, you can feel free to uh, type those out for me and I'll read them aloud or you can unmic and, and or turn on your camera and I will call on you when I see you pop up. Okay, so we have one. Uh, Lori asks, uh, how can we find out more about uh, what advocacy the council is doing? And do you have a newsletter? Yeah, so those advocacy priorities that we that I mentioned earlier on the advocacy page of our website, and again, all of those um, all of those documents are screen reader accessible. Um, there is an advocacy e-news. If you are not already subscribed to it, I would highly, highly recommend that you do so. Um, and you can do that either by sending an email to info at wcblind.org um, or going to our website yourself. Every second Monday, we publish an article that is advocacy focused. We talk about the issue, uh, why it's important to those of us with vision loss, what the council is doing about it, and then what you can do about it. Um, so we really support our grassroots advocates. We also issue advocacy alerts um, as things um, move forward. So we issued an advocacy alert when the joint finance committees were announced and um, included the link to that portal. Um, I probably will be, will probably be issuing an advocacy alert depending on what happens to a particular bill that would have negative consequences for med, uh, Badger Care users. So I'm watching that bill um, and depending on what action is taken, I'll be getting, we'll be getting out an alert on that. So, um, and those come into your email box. And then I think I heard something else come in on the chat. Yes, uh, somebody asks, um... Uh, it was my understanding that the Republicans were going to submit a separate budget. Is that still happening? Yes. So the um, what the Joint Finance Committee will do is they've reviewed the governor's budget. They have um, pretty much said that they will be returning to what's called base budget um, and writing their own proposals from there. And um, so even in our advocacy efforts with the Joint Finance Committee, because it's kind of a political minefield, we've been really mindful 
of whether or not we say that a provision has come out of the governor's budget, you know, that we favor the governor's budget. Um, we talk about it more about we favor this proposal and why we favor it. So yeah, we anticipate that many of the things that are in the governor's budget that would have been really advantageous um, to our population will either be removed or reduced. Um, and so we really need to advocate around them. Many of the transportation programs that we're gonna be talking about on Thursday, thankfully are part of state law, um, but uh, we need to see them be better funded. That's a great question, thank you. Other questions? Uh, there is a comment. Uh, if you go to a joint finance committee hearing, uh, make sure you get in line early. I testified in Waukesha a couple of weeks ago and I waited for seven hours before my turn to speak. Happy advocating. Yeah, Steve, I heard that. I heard that was your comment. Yes, exactly. The Joint Finance Committee um, hearings are both amazing because they are truly grassroots experiences, but yes, they are an all-day event. I was in line at Wisconsin Dells at 720, um, and I testified at 1.44 um, p.m. So uh, yes, it's a long day. Um, and two minutes, by the way, is only 300 words. So you have to make those 300 words matter. Uh, there was another question. Uh, will having veto power in the Senate be sufficient for overriding the governor? A supermajority is not needed in the House. Right. So no, go ahead, Erin, do you want to speak to that one? Yeah. Um, so Melanie, what you're referring to is the if they tried to impeach a constitutional officer, then they only need a majority vote in the assembly. Um, however, for a to override a veto, it is a two thirds majority in each house. So they have a two thirds majority in the Senate, but not a two thirds majority in the assembly. So there's they could because it's based on two thirds of members present. So if there were a day where a lot of Democrats were missing, they could try in the assembly, but no, it's, you do need a two thirds majority in both houses to override a budget veto or a bill veto. Excellent, thanks, Erin. Um, that's all the questions are on chat. Uh, if you'd like to add any, uh, please do so now, or you can un -mic and turn on your camera if you wish, and uh, I can call on you. These were awesome questions. Thank you so much um, for putting them in the chat. Jackson, thank you so much for um, tending to them. Um, if you have other questions that pop up, I would uh, um, encourage you to reach out um, because sometimes you don't know what your questions are until you sleep on it a little bit. So um, right after this session, realistically, either today or tomorrow morning, Kathleen, I'm not sure exactly when you've got this plan to go out, um, but you will be getting links to the session tomorrow at noon on um, access to quality uh, health care. And then you'll also get the, in that same email a link to our transportation session Thursday at noon. And we have uh, other guests, um, panelists that will be working with me. I'm super excited about those sessions and Really hope that you can join us. Those will be uh, recorded as well. So available on our YouTube channel. Um, I wanna do a big, huge thank you to uh, my fellow um, colleagues at the council who have been working with me for months on advocacy day to get the promotion out, to um, do registration, to get the materials together for our um, legislative packets that go to every legislator, both electronically and in paper form, and for um, helping to host these events. And to Aaron and Michael for all of you, your contributions to our advocacy work. And then a huge thank you to all of you for um, attending today and hopefully for becoming really powerful and strong advocates for uh, people with vision loss. So on that note, have a great evening.